Ava, it's time for one of my favorite events today. I survived trivia with Lauren Tarshish. I know, Connie. I love trivia. Lauren Tarshish is a New York Times bestselling author of the I Survived series. Today, she will discuss how she brings to life the stories of young and resilient people living through historical events, including the American Revolution, the Battle of D-Day, Hurricane Katrina, and more. After, she will answer some of your questions, and then we'll enjoy a round of trivia to test your knowledge of history. And I said it before, but I love trivia. Lauren, we're clearly excited to have you, so take it away. It is so great to be here. Um, I am, as a, I'm Lauren Tarshis. I write the I Survive series. I also do a lot of work on our magazines. I'm low to all of you readers and teachers. Um, I am just, I've been looking so forward to this. So we are going to celebrate World Read Aloud Day. I know it's really tomorrow, but we're getting a head start. I am going to be doing a lot of things. I'm going to be um, sharing some of my very favorite facts, most fascinating things that I've learned from all of the years that I've been writing I Survived. I'm going to share them with you. I'm going to do a little reading aloud, just a little. We're going to play a very exciting um, game of Kahoot. Um, for those of you who don't have Kahoot, do not worry. You will still love it. Teachers, if you're going to be on, you might want to sort of start getting ready. I'm going to tell you lots about that later, share the code. So it's going to be very calm with our Kahoot. And then I have some fantastic questions from a lot of kids who are out there today, some friends on Twitter. So we're going to be delving into some interesting areas of research and writing and all sorts of things. But let's get started. You know, I actually was very intrigued with the history of World Read Aloud Day. So, you know, it's been going on for 13 years. I think it's it's such a, it's very magical to think that on one day all around the world, people are just celebrating reading aloud and sharing their favorite stories and poems. And I hope you guys are gonna really do that. You should go home and share a book with your little sister and brother and your dog and your parents so we can all celebrate in different ways. And I actually, a little piece of our first fun fact, that it's actually celebrated in 173 countries. So I think that is really, um, that really stuck with me and I, I love that. So I now am going to shift into my way of celebrating World Read Aloud Day. And I really thought about what would be special. I wanted to do something um, a little different. And I, I, I'm always working on an I Survived book. Um, and I hope you guys, maybe you know this series. I don't know how many of you have actually read one of my books, but I've written, I've been writing this series for 10 years now, which I can't even believe, more than 10 years. And I'm actually just finishing up my 22nd I Survive book. And at the very end of this, I'm going to give you a teeny sneak peek. And then I have to get back to work because my final draft is due on Friday. So don't tell my editor that I'm actually here with you because I'm supposed to be working constantly. It'll be our secret. So the books are historical fiction. Um, they're all different. I write about natural disasters. I write about battles. I write about things that you've heard of like the American Revolution and the Civil War and D-Day. And I write about um, topics that maybe you don't know such a, much about like the molasses flood that happened in Boston when a giant tank of molasses exploded and flooded the entire North End or the, the explosion of this incredible airship called the Hindenburg that changed the history of air travel in 1937. So all these books are different. All of my characters are different. But one thing they all have in common is that I do tons of research for each one. And I, I just learn so much. And you guys would hate to live with me because if you're one, I have four kids and I'm always like stumbling out of my office and telling them some crazy thing that I learned while researching one of my books. And I, I don't, I actually, I have to be honest, I don't wanna upset my friend Ava who loves the word trivia, but I don't really love the word trivia because trivia means like something little, it's cool. Like we love to know it. And I'm gonna be sharing today with you big facts like important things that I want you to really think about that hopefully is going to are going to like spark curiosity. So even after I tell you about them, you're going to want to learn more on your own. Maybe in your classes today, you'll be so inspired. You'll want to go and often do some research with yourself or your friends. 
So that's really what I'm always doing. And I get so inspired. I hope you will let me know if you are inspired by some of these facts that I share with you today. And as I said, I kind of went back into all my research and I'm here in my office and I'm looking at all my stacks of books. It's very messy outside of this little, um, outside of this little screen books piled up, papers, everything. So I really scoured and I thought, what are some of the facts that for each of the books and articles that I've written for StoryWorks and Scope, what are some of those facts that have just really stuck in my mind and sometimes in my heart? So let's get started. And my friend Colin is running my slides today and he might jump in to rescue me. So Sharks, that was the second book that I wrote um, in the I Survive series. Um, I Survived the Shark Attacks of 1916. And I've written about, I've written a lot about them, not just in I Survive, but in some of my nonfiction true stories books. Um, here's one of them that I wrote. I wrote all about the true story of the shark attacks is in this book. And one of the things I learned about sharks is they are really not to be feared. You should be, they're just unbelievable creatures. And they were actually here. They're some of the oldest creatures on earth. In fact, scientists aren't exactly sure when they showed up, but it was way before us. Um, there were shark-like creatures swimming around in the oceans 450 million years ago. So you can just sort of let that settle in your mind. I mean, that's, I think T-Rex was running around 85 million years ago, 100 million years ago. So sharks were around way before even Tyrannosaurus rex. And just think about, I mean, they weren't exactly like the hammerhead or the great whites that are swimming today, but just think about the idea of what, a, what kinds of creatures have survived for all of these different, you know, thousands and millions of years. So that's my first fascinating um, fact about sharks. And I would just say the other thing I really want you to know about sharks is they need our protection. When I first, when I, I used to be really scared of them, but the more research I do, the more I understand how important they are for our earth, for our oceans without big sharks, because they are apex predators. You can look that up if you don't know what that means. That's a good term too, to keep in your minds. They're very important for the whole balance of our oceans. So without big sharks, a lot of things are going to be damaged and um, we won't even have as many fish to eat ourselves. So help us protect sharks. All right, Colin, let's go to fact number two. Oh my gosh, the Titanic. I have to just faint for a minute because I love the Titanic so much. <sighs> okay, where to begin? So the Titanic just the story of it is so interesting. Why are we still talking about it in all these years later? It happened in 1912. More books have been written about the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic, than almost any other topic in America. And because it's something that has so many different stories in it, you know, it's the story of all those passengers, all those human beings, men, women, and children who set on this, out on this voyage thinking they were on this most magical ship that could never sink. And then of course there was the disaster. But what I didn't quite realize when I started working on that book is that something even, I actually think that the story of how the wreckage of the Titanic was discovered in 1985 is at least as interesting as the story of the sinking. And I wrote about it actually in StoryWorks last year um, and I would actually love to write a whole book about it. But luckily, there have been books written about it, and you guys can research on your own the story of how Dr. Bob Ballard finally located the wreckage because no one really knew exactly where, where it was. They knew it was in the North Atlantic, somewhere between England and New York. They knew that it was you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles from land sunk into ocean that was two and a half miles deep. But it wasn't until the 80s that there was the technology available to locate the wreck, to find it, and then to actually go down to the bottom of the ocean to see it. So that's something that um, I feel that you guys should totally try to learn more about on your own. And again, in StoryWorks, um, we wrote about it. There's videos that we have about it. I, um, I think that Dr. Ballard himself is a, is, is, a, is a person that you guys should really want to learn more about. So that's why I chose that as fact number two. All right, Colin. All right, so wildfires, these are scary and they've been so much in the news and that's really why I wanted to share this with you today. I wrote about, I've written a lot about wildfires. In fact, the reason I wrote my I Survived book on wildfires, I don't know how many of you have read that, 
But I wrote about it because of a, a really lovely woman who's become a friend named Holly Fisher, who lives with her family in Paradise, California, which is a beautiful, beautiful town in the foothills of the Sierra Mountains. And Holly's son, Lucas, it was a reader of my book, my books, my I Survive series. And in 2018, Holly and her husband, Josh, who's a firefighter, and Lucas and his sister, Sienna, they survived a very serious wildfire in their town that destroyed much of their town of paradise. So um, I actually went to visit them twice and learned all about it. And that's what inspired me to write my I Survived book. Um, and there are just so many just wild facts about wildfires, the power of these of these enormous infernos that can burn, you know, that have burned, you know, millions of acres of our of lands all over the country, particularly in the West. So I want you to learn more about those because there's a lot that we can do to protect ourselves, to stay safe. And there's a lot we can do to try to prevent them by, you know, by, you know, the way that we um, interact with nature, the way we have our property. So there's a lot for you guys to learn about that. And I've written a lot about it in my book. But one of the really the, this little detail was really, um, really stuck with me that fi wildfires actually create their own weather systems and they create their own clouds. There are light lightning, lightning storms within wildfires. And there are also these crazy whirlwinds made of fire that are caused by the winds inside these enormous fires. And for many years, people didn't believe that they um, believe that they actually existed. People swore they had seen them, survivors of fires, and people just thought they were imagining things. But in 2018, in within in a wildfire known as the Car Fire, C A R R. Someone actually captured a video and it proved that these, in fact, do exist, fire tornadoes. All right, number four. I just had to share this with you. Just read that. There are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on every beach on the earth. Isn't that just beautiful? I just, I don't even remember where, to tell you the truth, I don't think I found that in one of my I Survive books. I think it was one of the stories I wrote for StoryWorks about um, whether aliens exist in the universe. And I think they do because the universe is so huge. And I wanted to share this for you because I really was sharing it for all of you future authors. How many of you think you might wanna be an author? How many of you just wanna write more beautiful papers so your teachers are very happy with you? Describing things is something that I'm always looking to do in I Survived and in my StoryWorks articles. I want to describe things in ways that really light up your mind and help you understand them better. So instead of just saying there are trillions and trillions and trillions of stars, I really wanted to have something that I could compare that number with. And I came across this um, in, in a book that I was reading about the universe. And to me, every time I'm on a beach, I look around and I just even try to imagine how many grains of sand are they? there. And then I think, how many beaches are there? How many grains of sand are on every beach? And that's, and at night when I look up at the sky and I try to imagine how many stars there are, that's what I think of. So I just wanted to make sure that you had that little image in your mind as well. Okay. Okay. So here I'm going to do a little read aloud for you, just a little very short one. And this is also sort of a, something I wanted to share because of descriptions and, um, and how, how sometimes in my I Survive books, I really struggle to describe the um, a lot of the science that I learned. So most people, when they think of volcanoes, they think of lava. Like, and, and there are many volcanoes like those in Hawaii, Kilauea in Hawaii, that are oozing lava. But lava actually moves pretty slow. We, we could all run away from lava. The dangerous thing about volcanoes and not all the volcanoes actually have this force, but Mount St. Helens in Washington State, which I wrote about, and Vesuvius, which is in um, Italy, which I wrote about because it erupted in ancient Roman times. Both of those are volcanoes that when they erupted, they spewed this super hot, um, just really terrifying toxic gas and it blasted out and burned and then shot down the mountain and burned everything in its path. And that's really what caused these um, most of the death and destruction. So I just wanted to quickly read, this is from um, I Survived, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And I just wanted to quickly read you the description 
of what it was like for my characters, um, Jess and Eddie and Sam, to be in a pyroclastic flow in Mount St. Helens in 1980. Now, remember, when I survived, is this, these are all historical fiction. So all the facts are true, but I make up my characters. But even my characters' experiences are based on real real experience that real experiences that people who lived through the through these events have so even though this is this didn't you know eddie and sam and jess are not real people their experience is based on the real experience of people who survived saint helens here it goes there was a loud whoosh that shook the ground a blast of searing heat knocked them off their feet the air seemed to turn to fire Jess had never felt such heat. It was hotter than the diner kitchen on a broiling August day, hotter than mom's oven when she baked bread. The pyroclastic surge, Jess realized, the fiery hurricane wind packed with poisonous gash and gas and ash. It was the killer wind that had destroyed Saint-Pierre. The heat blasted over them and Jess felt as though she was being cooked from the inside out. Every breath was like inhaling fire. She looked around with desperation, knowing that she, they wouldn't last more than a few seconds if they stood here. Just a few yards away was a huge hole, one of the grave-like pits caused by the earthquake. It was wide and at least 10 feet deep. Almost without thinking, Jess hold, grabbed hold of the twins, gri gripped their arms with all her, her might. There, she cried, yanking them toward the huge pit. It was their only hope. They all jumped in. Jess came down hard on her shoulder. She bit her tongue and tasted blood, but she barely noticed. There was only heat, terribly, terrible, blistering heat. So that's another example of, you know, trying to describe something that um, most people haven't heard of, the pyroclastic surge. Okay, moving along. The deadliest natural disaster in American history is the Galveston hurricane, which happened 120 years ago. That was my latest I Survive book. And I found that just quite shocking that this, this happened so long ago, but it is still the deadliest natural disaster. And the reason for that is because this island in the south of Texas was basically swallowed up by the ocean during a storm that came in, in 1900. And um, one of the things, they don't even really know exactly how many people lost their lives. Officially it's 6,000, but many experts think it was more like 10,000. And one of the things that we should realize is that we learned a lot from that disaster and we're much safer today because of what we learned. So hurricanes in America have not been as deadly since, although they are still very frightening um, and dangerous. Okay, number seven. Oh, George Washington. I love him so much. My kids make fun of me. They feel that, um, that, you know, I'm in love with him. I kind of am. Sometimes I just look at a dollar bill, stare at it. Because not just because he's so famous. Um, do you know that there are more places named after George Washington than anyone else in America? It's true. You probably live in a town that has a Washington street, or maybe you live in Washington state or Washington DC, but I don't love him because he's famous. I love him because he was a big failure. He made so many mistakes. He was a disaster during the Revolutionary War in the first years, but he did not give up. He learned. He didn't just go, I quit. I did, I, I did a terrible job and I'm, I'm a terrible general and I quit and I'm so embarrassed. He did not do that. He learned and he was humble and he listened to people and he admitted that he made mistakes. And he got better and better at being a general. And by the end, he led America to you know, break away from England. He became our president and he was a quite wonderful president. And that's why I love George Washington. Okay, eight. This was pretty crazy too, guys. When I was writing the Chicago Fire book, I figured, well, this has to be the deadliest fire in American history because it's called the Great Chicago Fire and it's the most famous fire but it wasn't the deadliest fire in American history. The deadliest fire in American history happened the very same night, but very few people have heard of it unless you live in Wisconsin where it happened. A town called Peshtigo, which is north of Chicago. 
And just like Chicago, it had been very dry and very windy for months and months. So the same conditions that started the Chicago fire started the Peshtigo fire. But the Peshtigo fire was more like a wildfire because it was it was a huge area of forest. A lot of people lived there. And um, it, it just, when that fire hit, it burned through this huge forested area. Many people lost their lives. I wrote a story in StoryWorks on that, and it's one of my most popular stories. And I also put it in this book, Nature Attacks. I added to it. And the headline of this story is um, one of my favorite headlines that we've written. It's called The Blood Red Night. And that comes from a description of the Pestigo fire from one of the survivors. He said that the sky turned blood red. I've never forgotten that. Okay, here is our very last fact. And this is just something that I think is really, I, re I wrote about the history of dogs and story works. And this, all dogs, you're, I have a poodle. My neighbor has a, you know, has a German shepherd. Um, you, I don't know what kind of dog you guys have, but all of our, all of our dogs descend from wolves. And it was really, it was during the ice age that wolves started to make friends with humans. We sort of teamed up because wolves could protect us and we could feed them scraps and wolves became tamer. And slowly over many years, over, you know, I don't know, I think it's maybe 15, between 18 and 35,000 years, dogs have, have changed into all these different breeds. There are about 300 breeds now, not officially, but um, all of those different breeds goes go back to wolves. And that's another thing that you guys can research on their own. There's some wonderful books about this. And also I do think that you should love wolves and we should wanna protect them. So we are done with our facts, our trivia. Are you ready to play some Kahoot? I hope you are. So here is the URL. Um, if kids, if you're home, make sure you have an adult with you. Teachers, you'll see the URL right there, kahoot.it. Um, there's the passcode. We're going to give you a couple of minutes. And again, if you don't have Kahoot, don't worry. You guys can just play as teams in your classrooms. We're just going to let kids be joining, give you a couple minutes here. Um, and we are going to have a very good time. And remember, I think that pretty much everything in this Kahoot game for you listener, people who listen closely, you're going to win because um, we're taking the questions from um, from the facts that I shared. So, oh, good. We have a lot of people playing. That's awesome. Give a little more time. I wish maybe I should be reading aloud to you while we're getting um, while we're getting on. I know what I can show you. You know what I want to show you? I want to show you my new picture book. I'm wheeling over here. This is my newest book. And it's for your little brothers and sisters. It's, it has a very silly name. It's called Only My, no My Dog Knows I Pick My Nose. But it's not about picking your nose. It's really about how even when we're not perfect, people will love us. And I know I am doing a World Read Aloud event tomorrow at, I guess, is it? I think it's one o'clock again. Um, so you guys can look that up. And I'm really excited about it. All right. How are we doing? Oh my gosh, we are just, we're, is there a, is there a verb for kahoot, kahooting? Because that's what we're doing now. All right. They were going to have music during the kahoot like thing, but it was very loud and we all found it to be, um, we did like, um, we did like the, uh, the music but we found it a little overwhelming. And then I think my friend Lara, who's on this, she kept dancing and then she was afraid she'd be on the camera. All right. I think that we probably can start to, we can get started. Yep. Look, Lara just texted me. She said, yes, I was dancing. All right, everyone. I see some, I'm saying hi to all of you. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Elena. Hi. Let's see. Oh, these are some, Bo, Nikki. All right. We are, we are, we are rocking towards a thousand people, which is awesome. And my friend Jessica is going to run the Kahoot. So we'll give a couple more minutes. And um, after this, we're going to do this quickly. And then I have some great questions from, um, from, from some of our readers. And I can't wait to answer those. Okay, Jessica, I think you can fire us up.
I survive trivia. Here we go. What is the most dangerous part of a volcanic eruption? The poisonous gas, the exposure to volcanic ash, lava flow, or flying debris. Ooh, I think we have a typo here. Debris. We didn't proofread this. Let's blame, let's blame someone else. I didn't look at this closely. I'll give you extra points if you know. Debris is actually an awesome word. So make sure you know how to spell it because it has a really good spelling. Okay, poisonous gas, the pyroclastic surge. Awesome. Let's go to the next one. Are we going? How are we doing, Jessica? Here we go. How many years ago did the Galveston, the Galveston hurricane occur? You guys know that. I told you that. I would give you a hint, but I think I'd get in trouble. Hmm. I'm trying to think of another fact about the Galveston hurricane that I found really... Oh, I know what I have to tell you. Back in 1900, before the hurricane, there were more millionaires living in Galveston than any other city in America. Isn't that interesting? Okay, how many years ago did the Galveston hurricane occur? 122, it happened in 1900. So how'd you guys do? Okay, very good. And we will move, I'm sure most of you got that. All right, we'll go to the next one. We've got two more. What kind of weather can wildfires create? Hurricanes, excessive rainfall, fog, or fire tornadoes? I think you know this one, but actually, hmm, yeah. There we go. Let's see. Anyone get that? You can, I wish I could hear you. There's a school not far from my house, and if anyone's playing and if anyone's yelling, I'd probably hear them. Okay, and the answer is fire tornadoes. Very good. All right, and we have our last question, and then I'm going to take my, my fabulous reader questions. And the next one is how many countries are celebrating World Read Aloud Day? Well, I know that but I'm not allowed to play. Is it 173, 193, 90, or 115? All right. And while you guys do those answers, I am going to be getting ready for our next segment. I have some, I have, th we have three kids who are on video who asked wonderful questions and I can't wait for you to meet them. Up, oh, let's see what the answer is. It's 173. And I bet that's growing. That would be a good thing for you guys to research too. I'm always thinking of what the next thing is that I want to learn because you can, that's what, that's what's so fun. It's like, you can always learn new stuff. All right. So let's jump to some questions. Colin, can you, can we see, can we meet Mia? Our first questioner. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for taking my question. How long does it take to write a book? Fabulous. Well, it takes me about, I don't know, eight months a year to write an I Survive book because I do so much research. But you can take as much time as you want. Guess how long it took me to write my first book? Ten years. Because I was a, I didn't know how to write. I had to learn, and I had to write a lot of really bad books before I wrote a book that wasn't so bad. That's how you get better by doing it. So that was fantastic. And now let's meet Blake, our next questioner. Hi, Mr. Tertius. So I'm a huge fan of all of your I Survive books, and I have a quick question. So throughout your research of the historical events that you're going to write about, how do those events affect the personalities and developments of the characters that you write about in your books? 
Blake, because I feel he's like a college professor. I really had to think about this question. So he brought up the fact, as I said earlier, that I'm writing historical fiction. So it was such a great question because I know all the facts of my events after I research it. I know that there's going to be a hurricane in Galveston. And Colin, you can go to the next slide, show a slide here. So when I was, I knew that Galveston was going to be totally destroyed, but then I had to make up my characters. And the next slide will show you, here's Charlie, my main character. Um, um, and his little sister, Lulu. So I had to make sure that Charlie grows and changes during the story. So anytime you're reading my I Survive books, I want you to really think about, or any book you're reading, any fiction book, how does the character grow and change? So through going through this hurricane, and you can go to the next one, um, Colin, um, you know, learning about Galveston, this is one of my favorite pictures from the book. Um, my, my character, Charlie, learns to be um, stronger, learns to be braver, and um, I have to work all of that out as I'm writing these I Survive books. So Blake makes it make, just reminded me why these books are so challenging for me to write, because they really are challenging, because it's not just the event. I have to really make sure that these characters come to life. So thank you so much. And now let's meet Tess, who is, our, who is another questioner. And she had a great question that I'm excited. What has been your favorite topic to research and any advice for young writers? I don't have my, so Colin, go to the next slide because a couple kids um, asked this question on Twitter. Um, some of, uh, one of the fourth graders from Valley Catholic School asked about research as well. Um, and Mrs. Lutz, Lutz's class from Joplin from Martin Luther School had asked on Twitter what my favorite book was. So these are two, they're, the next two slides show that I, I have to do so much research. I have, to, I have to read a ton. I talk to experts, historians, scientists, people who've lived through, often the people who've lived through these events. And I've traveled to every single place that I've written about. So here's me in Gettysburg. And then the next one, Colin, is me in, um, that's where I'm in Mount St. Helens in Washington State. So I could show you, we could just spend you know hours. I could take you through all the pictures on all my research trips. But um, the, 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 just the amount of research and these experiences of walking in my character's footsteps, because that's what it feels like when I'm going to these places, is one of the things that I love the most about, um, about writing the series. And Madeline from Cardinal Elementary had wanted to know if my books will be made into movies. And I'm not sure about that, but I've always thought that the Mount St. Helens book would be one of my favorite ones to bring to life as a movie. And I hope you can all go visit that place in, in Washington State because Mount St. Helens is now a whole science park where you can learn everything you need to know. All right, well, we are near the end. And what I wanted to share with you is I survived 22, what I'm going to be writing about for this book. So I'm almost done, guys. It's been grueling. I've been staying up till two in the morning, waking up at five in the morning, writing my many, 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 many drafts. I'm writing about, Colin, the Great Wellington Avalanche Disaster of 1910. It is in, I'll go to the uh, the map. It's a, this, is, this happened in Washington State, not too far from Mount St. Helens, um, in a mountain range called the Cascades, which is also where Mount St. Helens is. A very, um, very difficult, um, more snow falls in the Cascade Mountains than almost anywhere in America. And in 1910, next slide, a train that looked exactly like this train got stranded in a blizzard on the side of a cliff in the middle of the mountains and there was another train with it. Next slide, um, Colin, this just gives you a sense of what it was like. It was stranded for six days. Um, it was terrifying just to be stranded in this blizzard on a train. And then an avalanche came crashing down from the mountain above, knocked both trains off a cliff. And that is today still the deadliest avalanche in American history. But it's also really been interesting for me, not only to learn about avalanches, but to learn all about um, all about um, train travel back then. So I'm very excited to be able to, to get that book out there. It comes out in the fall. So I just wanted to... Um, 
there's so much more I would like to share with you, but this is the end of our little time together. I think that we're going to be um, contacting the Kahoot winners, but I'm not sure if there was some issue with that scoring. I did see something a little strange, but I'll let Jessica worry about that. Um, I just really wanted to tell you how much I have loved being with you. Um, there's lots more that you can find out about my books on my website, lots of free stuff for you teachers, teaching materials, videos. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I love hearing from you. And kids, please be in touch. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of world read aloud day. I hope you really celebrate. And I'm so grateful that I got to spend this time with you. That was amazing. And you guys did a great job with the trivia. I couldn't agree more, Connie. It was great. Don't forget, you can shop our world read aloud days classic store online using code RAD2022 for 15% off. Later today at 4 p.m. Eastern, we will turn to our education and literacy experts for a panel on how to incorporate literacy anytime, anywhere, featuring Pam Allen, Tammy Charles, and Dr. Jacqueline Sanderlin. Our specialists will discuss the different ways to engage students in learning outside of the classroom and the connection between stories and fostering community. We will see you at 4 p.m. Eastern.